Hello, everyone again. Welcome back to the podcast. And today we'll be um, branching off into a more cognitive aspect of psychology, which is learning and memory. So this may be relevant to all of us right now, considering that um, you, the people listening to this podcast are probably students who are fulfilling their uh, requirements I, for the general psychology I hope psychology my course. students are mm-hmm. actually watching this or listening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. And anyone, of course, is welcome to learn from Mount Pia and I. So I guess we can begin this topic with asking um, how do human beings learn and why should we even learn about learning? Why is it important to value learning about learning? Well, um, by the time my students are uh, watching this, they would have been in school learning for how long? Like when you enter college, how long had you been uh, in the formal schooling system? So they've been, let's say, six to seven years. Oh, I'm not sure anymore about um, the new K to 12 system, but let's say high school. High school is around 12. Oh, from grade one to grade 12, right? That's 12 years plus. 12 years. Mm -hmm. So learning or the idea of learning has been, is there literally from the moment you can walk okay or for the moment you start making sounds and your parents start trying to teach you words learning is really just something that goes with being a a human being okay so we all learn it's something that's just part of everyday life and without it um we wouldn't be doing anything it's almost like we're not human if we don't learn if we don't acquire new behaviors if we don't um repeat behaviors if we don't retain uh knowledge retain information Um, a large part of what we know as consciousness is actually stuff that we've learned meaning we've retained in our memory uh, and yeah, I guess that's why th- this module is also quite important because it really just talks about something that's very normal and regular and here in our everyday lives. All right. So we also know learning as a relatively permanent change in our brains, like uh, neurons making new connections in our brains. But in speaking in real life, how do we know that learning has occurred? Well, um, like jumping off from what you just said because last time we recorded we were talking about how um, uh, fish the biopsychological perspective is connected to everything that we're going to be talking about and so yeah you, you just pointed it out that learning is making our neurons training our neurons to kind of like order themselves in a particular way to fire in a particular way and that kind of encodes in our brain um, something like, uh, for example, learning to um, ride a bike, okay? Mm -hmm. Riding a bike is one of those uh, tasks that once you know it, you know it kind of forever. Um, And I guess it's the same with driving. A thing that I never learned. (laughs) Um, But so, yeah, um, it starts off as something that is quite um, confusing. Like, do you remember when you learned how to drive? Yes, I was uh, 17, my last year of high school, and I just wanted to drive for the first time. I wanted the freedom. So, yeah, at first, uh, I, I remember being in a driving school and all of the um, controls looked so scary at first. And it's uh, it felt really foreign having to do so many things at once, like having right. to not, uh, change the gears and um, uh, turn the wheel and be mindful of the other drivers who are around yeah. you. And then, okay, so you're driving 
mm-hmm. uh, automatic. Or I stick. actually drove a stick at first. I All don't right. know how to drive so, that anymore. So but brakes, yeah. brakes, mm-hmm. and gas. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so just imagine that driving is not one task. Driving is, at the very least, you describe four. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the gears. Okay. The brakes and gas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Actually, now it's five. Brakes and gas, that's one task, uh, two tasks. And then the direction, okay, or the, the wheels, the steering wheel, that's another task. And then being aware of your surroundings, that's another task. Those are five tasks. So when you begin learning something, you, something complex like driving, at first, you're thinking about each of those tasks separately. Mm-hmm. Okay? That's why uh, it's confusing. So as you were learning how to drive, it was like, oh, got to shift gears. Oh, got to look up the road. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll add two more tasks. You have to look up your, uh, the, the rear, the view, rear view mirror. mirror and yeah. then you have to look at the the mirrors the, the side mirrors the yeah. side mirrors um, and then sometimes you also have to flick the signal lights okay yes. and uh, if it's raining you have to turn on the wipers okay mm-hmm. you have to be careful about how to use your brakes so all these different things because of the different conditions that happens will change your behavior so it really is a really really complex behavior so learning is uh, putting all those little steps, okay, and then getting to a point where those steps feel natural to you, mm-hmm. okay? Where driving goes from um, 10 different tasks, separate tasks, into just one task, mm-hmm. driving. Okay. Now, the process of getting it there is, uh, well, it's actually, I don't know. Will we talk about it later? Maybe we'll get to talk about it, but I'll, I'll just mention it now. The process of getting it there is called consolidation. Okay, And this particular kind of learning, uh, driving, is something that gets uh, stored and and it it turns into this memory we call procedural memory Mm -hmm. so it's memory of skills memory of things we do behaviors actions so at first the procedural memory is 10 because there's 10 different tasks that you do but after a while it consolidates and then um you store it somewhere in your um, hind brain, Mm -hmm. actually probably in your cerebellum, okay, where a lot of procedural memories get stored, Mm -hmm. so that it turns into uh, a smooth flowing action. So instead of many different things, it's just this one blob called driving. Mm -hmm. That's learning, going from all of that into that one and then it's something you never forget in fact it's something you can do people who really know how to drive they can drive and like go into uh daydream conversation or automatic or yeah you're even watching something but that's not don't do that don't do that don't do that that. (laughs) don't do that don't be on a call don't text Mm Um, but yeah, sometimes you go in automatic mode and it's just, it's just like, how did I get from point A to point B? Well, you're driving and your body, uh, because it becomes what I think the common term is muscle memory. Okay? Mm-hmm. It becomes muscle memory. Uh, it's a procedural memory that now your body has memorized how to do. So mm-hmm. it's not an active thing anymore. You're not thinking about it anymore. You're not thinking about it here. You're not analyzing every step. It's something that is now just one step and it's there done by your unconscious, um, the automatic parts of your brain, your hind brain. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's how learning occurs. 
in terms of behavior. And I then also just describe how learning occurs in terms of where it goes in your brain. Mm-hmm. So that's learning. So think of driving as a complex behavior. There are many behaviors that are quite complex also too that we learn how to do. Um, another example is studying. Mm-hmm. Right? When we say study, what does that mean? Studying is not just one behavior. It's not sitting down in class, which is not happening anymore, (laughs) right? But maybe before we used to think it was like that. Studying means going to class, going home, doing your homework, reviewing for a test. But now, um, and I'm sure for all, all my current students, that's what they have thought studying to be for at least 12 years. And for at least 12 years, it's been true. But now, all of a sudden, um, we are doing learning in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now there's no class. Now there's just the book. There's just the modules. And there are just these podcasts. Mm -hmm. So this is now, if you're finding it difficult, okay, difficult to adjust, difficult to learn in the situation. Don't worry. It's really difficult and I know it is because I know how learning works. <laughs> What's happening is you are teaching your brain a set of new um, skills, mm-hmm. right? a set of new behaviors. And until those new behaviors are uh, combined seamlessly into this new concept called studying, it will be hard. Like driving is hard and confusing until somehow it kind of weaves together and it becomes this one thing that you know how to do. Okay, okay. So um, I just put in a little bit of like encouragement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Be encouragement kind to there. yourselves, everyone. We're yeah. all navigating new territory, and it's okay yeah. if you don't know how to allocate your time yet or yeah. work with so many distractions. But we're all just learning, and we should all be kind to ourselves. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So again, that's another procedural memory that mm-hmm. that is new. So yeah, that's okay. I mean, now that we're there, okay. Um, do you remember? <laughs> I'm sorry to both <laughs> ball at you. Mm-hmm. So procedural memory is one kind of memory, mm-hmm. right? There are two. Um, mm-hmm. There are other kinds of memory. Mm-hmm. Um, mm, so procedural memory are memory of um, oh, like skills. skills. Mm-hmm. Okay. Automatic you process, the other like, uh, Declarative memories or memories that you can say, like facts or ideas. For example, recalling terms from a book or recalling a memory. Right, mom? Yes. Oh. All right. Declarative memory. And there are two kinds of declarative memory. Mm-hmm. There's semantic memory. Mm-hmm. And then there's episodic memory. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, can so, we differentiate between that? Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, episodic memory, and I just like the difference really is episodic memory is about episodes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, episodic memory is our memory of uh, the things that happened to us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like our everyday life. What did you do yesterday? What did you do last weekend? <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, that was just yesterday. Okay. Yeah. These are the um the episodes of our lives and that gets encoded into episodic memories Mm -hmm. and then semantic memories are the things that we learn okay knowledge um trivia uh what was the kingdom of bavaria for example Mm -hmm. that just happens to be a random thing in my semantic memory is something that i learned once upon a time what is the answer just so everyone what is the answer to that what uh, what is the kingdom of oh the kingdom of bavaria mm-hmm. that's just one of the territories in what is now germany oh okay, <laughs> okay. good to know good to know just like that. yeah okay um, yeah yeah so though so, that's mm-hmm. semantic memory so so right now when we think of memory or learning uh we can learn many different things but there are many different types of things so mm-hmm. I guess you, we can start with those three. Okay, there are things we learn that are skills. Mm-hmm. Okay, and these things get stored in our cerebellum. Okay, 
I encourage that highly. Um, and they turn into what we know as muscle memory. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like driving, using chopsticks, uh, walking. Okay, mm-hmm. you know, babies have to learn how to walk. Walking is a procedure of memory mm-hmm. that we teach our bodies to do. And then you can just walk without thinking about it. You don't have to think about putting one foot. You know, you just don't. So, mm-hmm. procedural memories. And then um, episodic memories, this is memories of our lives, stories of our lives. And while we're at it, um, when you think of your life, what memories do you remember? Like, for example, um, if I ask you to remember a memory from when you were nine years old, Mm -hmm. you will remember something, right? Yes. Yes. I remember being uh, experiencing snow for the first time. I think that's the first thing that pops up in my mind. We were in Canada. All right. Um, so seeing yeah. snow for the first time. Mm-hmm. This memory, okay, what makes it stand out from all the other memories that happened to you when you were nine years old? I think because it was a novel experience. It was okay. traveling to a new place and experiencing something I've never experienced before. Okay. All right. And so was it something that you took pictures of? Uh, actually, not that I remember. We don't have um, uh, physical pictures of it, but it, the image in my mind is very clear. Okay. Yeah. Was it something you kept on going back to and remembering? Mm-hmm. Like you tell stories about it, you think about it? Every What's time about? I, yeah, every time I, um, tell my friends about when I first experienced snow and people are always wondering, Oh, what that, what's that like? Especially since we live in the Philippines and it's not yeah. common. So, right. Mm-hmm. right. So um, this is a particular thing about episodic memories. Our episodic memories uh, are, we are likely to remember like what do we actually remember? Cause we live life every day. Like mm-hmm. we, form a lot of episodic memories, but what's the difference between the ones that we remember and the ones that we don't? Well, the ones that we remember are the things that we probably do this action uh, to, and that's rehearsal, Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay? Um, So a thing about memory too is memory needs to be rehearsed in order to be uh, encoded um, into long-term storage. Right. So like procedural memories, memories of skills, mm-hmm. um, you can only encode them into their more permanent forms if you keep practicing. Right. Doing the see, action again and again. Yeah, yes. see, I tried to drive, but I d- never practiced for too long enough to actually encode it into my long-term memory. That's why I never, until now, I can do that. So there's a lack of rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Unless it's like a zombie apocalypse and it doesn't matter what I hit, that's when I'll drive. Uh Yeah. So so I technically know how to do it, but I'm just I just haven't practiced enough to be comfortable enough to do it just any time. So you know how to drive because you kept on doing it. Mm -hmm. So that's what rehearsal is. You just keep doing and doing and doing something. Now It's the same with our episodic memories, a different kind, Um, memories of our own lives. The memories that we are likely to keep recalling are things we keep on rehearsing. Therefore, we keep on telling, talking about it. We keep on um, recalling it for ourselves. There are things around us that are associated with that memory. So that makes those memories harder, right? They're, they're uh, in terms of the brain, uh, it encodes those memories into those neurons more because you keep on using that neuron, neural pathway okay, mm-hmm. that makes up that memory. So, so yeah, so think about the memories that are more, um, uh, easily accessible, that are bright, that are really, really vivid. They're like that, probably because those are the memories you kept on going back to again and again and again. So, 
So yeah, so that's for episodic memories. And now we get to semantic memory, mm -hmm. right? Um, because semantic memories are probably the things that students are most concerned about because what we go to school for, ah, uh, that those are semantic memories. Mm -hmm. Just knowledge that um, we somehow need to remember. Mm -hmm. So what are your strategies for um, keeping semantic memories, especially as a professor and for the students who are listening here? So what are ways we can? So my, the same way as rehearsal is important for procedural memories and episodic memories, rehearsal is also important for mm -hmm. semantic memory uh, and, and retaining um, the things you need to remember. Okay? So how do we do rehearsal? Okay? Does it mean just repeating something again and again and again, which is called maintenance rehearsal? <laughs> Um, that's true, you can do that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's also what might be called rote memorization. Just repeat it again and again and again. So it's just like writing your notes over yeah. and over again or yeah. repeating the same thing in your head, uh, memorizing yeah. it off a list. Yeah, that's example. maintenance rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, maintenance rehearsal is good for retaining um, information, but not for the long term. It's not the best way to encode uh, to encode memory into your long term memory. Mm -hmm. So what is that more? Oh, okay. All right. Just remember your hippocampus. Okay. <laughs> All of this actually yeah, has to do with the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Consolidation happens or long term with, memories hippocampus. with the hippocampus. All mm -hmm. right. My little throwback to yeah. module two. Now let's go back to module module six. Um, what is a more effective way of getting your semantic memories, information you try to study, you try to remember for your classes, uh, just to get it into long-term memory so that you can remember it, you can retrieve it later on when you need to, like for a test, or if for some reason it becomes relevant in your life sometime in the future, how will you be able to retrieve it? Well, uh, there's another kind of rehearsal that's quite, in, is more effective in getting information into long-term memory, and that's called elaborative rehearsal. Mm -hmm. So, Ina, this thing we're doing actually is a long-winded process that just, mm -hmm. I hope, is something mm -hmm. that will help uh, the students and you and me to <laughs> keep remembering and consolidate know, our, own, like, um, our own memories of psych concepts psych concepts yes. it's because um this is elaborative rehearsal and what is elaborative rehearsal elaborative rehearsal is making a piece of information meaningful mm -hmm. okay so i the try i like to, to say learning psych is actually quite easy <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't. Um, uh, learning psychic is quite easy because it's easy to do elaborative rehearsal with psychology. Okay, it's easy to take these concepts and see and ask yourself, how is this true for myself in my own life? Mm -hmm. So we're here. We're talking about the concepts of of psych and we're relating it to our lives. We're talking about how it is true in this way or in that way. Um, and that's what elaborative rehearsal is. The more you relate the concept and you make it applicable, or you find how it is related to things that you already care about, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm assuming people care about their lives. Mm -hmm. so it's a good skill to have. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, that makes whatever concept you learn more, more easily encoded into a uh, long-term memory mm -hmm. so for example last week hey last week we talked about uh, the biological uh, perspective the brain, okay? yes, the brain. Okay. so I, I just wondered what part of oh you weren't my student for a <laughs> what were you what are my student for you i was your student for personality ma'am personality yes that's just one, that's just one class Actually, yes. I think ah, okay. And then after that, we worked with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
what was the concept in Persa that you remember the most until now? Probably Freud. Yeah, uh, we spent a long time on Freud and I think his uh, concepts were quite controversial okay. or even from the time when they were conceptualized and up to now it's like the Oedipus complex is probably one of the most salient um, things in my memory like you'd never expect someone to hypothesize that people normally uh, fall in love with their opposite sex parent or want to you know have sex with them and then yeah so it's, it was quite new and that's why it's okay uh, so it's novel but because it was novel was it something you found yourself thinking about like even outside of class absolutely and it, it kind of also makes you realize like oh with this actually can i relate this to my own life um no but it the fact that it made you think about it and made you relate it to your own life just made it stick all the more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it just in your head or would you talk to your friends about it? Oh, we all your talked classmates. about it. Yeah, all of us. I think every uh, when you did teach about the Oedipus complex, everyone was like, what? And everyone in class, I, do, you, did you, uh, do you feel that way when you talk about the Oedipus complex? I just know it. I, I just know it's something that really shocks people mm -hmm. and it's just so weird. So yeah, mm -hmm. that is one of the things that mm -hmm. I know will stick because mm -hmm. it's weird and I ask them to think about their lives, but then the moment they start thinking about their lives, um, mm, like, did you start looking at your attachment, for example, to your father? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Right. And did looking at your attachment to your father bring you to some realizations about yourself in your life yes yes all right you there that right it just doesn't apply <laughs> but right. it's yeah it doesn't apply but mm -hmm. but what did you discover other things about yourself when you actually looked that direction mm -hmm. it, it did make me realize how uh my own attachment to my father how i see their relationship between my parents plays out in how i um, view relationships in other people. So yeah. it made me aware of that. Yeah. Right. There. That's elaborate the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. okay? It's not just one is to one. Mm -hmm. Like this concept is this definition. No. You now have this concept. Does it apply here? No. But how does how, what does here look like and how does it not apply? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And there. So yeah. because of that exercise, because you talked about it with your friends, you thought about your own life, etc. It's stuck. Mm -hmm. right? That's elaborate the rehearsal. It's the and more so, you're able to connect it to other concepts that you do know, other events yeah. in your life, the yeah. more that there's like an interconnected network that the knowledge can just um, uh, seep into and attach to. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any other concept that actually helped you? So, Oedipus complex didn't actually help you understand your mm -hmm. relationship with your parents. Mm -hmm. But was there any concept in person that actually helped you understand your relationship with your parents? Mm, I think the concept of the psychosexual stages in mm -hmm. Ericsson's. So it was, I think at the time I was going through, a, um, a, as an adolescent, I was going through the identity versus, versus uh, role yeah. confusion and especially okay. when I think a lot of people who are my who are my age at the time in, in yeah. college are thinking about um, career and their sense of identity so it made me contextualize my own crisis that I was experiencing at that stage and realize uh, like there was a form of validation all right that it provided mm -hmm. all right so the psychosocial stages, let me just correct you. Oh, sorry, so psychosocial. It'll psychosocial. Yes. come up later. Yes. Yeah, psychosocial yes. stages right. were something that stuck to you more mm -hmm. um, because I guess it was a point of comparison from uh, Freud's um, phallic stage in the Oedipus mm -hmm. complex. And mm -hmm. then here's Erickson with a different point of view. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh no, I relate to that one. Right. Mm -hmm. So now you connect two concepts and you remember two concepts instead of one and not just the definition that is written on the book, but what it actually means. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And it's been how many years since you took that class? Wow. I maybe around two or three years. Okay. Right. Yeah. And you still remember it. 
mm-hmm. there. So that means it's definitely in your long-term memory. Mm-hmm. So that's elaborate and rehearsal. It's not just rote uh, repetition mm-hmm. of uh, a concept and its definition. Mm-hmm. It is applying and redefining, not redefining, finding your own way to define it via examples in your own life. Mm-hmm. That's right. elaborate and rehearsal. Okay. So, and that's the main thing, actually, if, if my students take away anything at all from um, this class, it's that um, what we're trying to do is trying to get them to do elaborative rehearsal on these concepts so that mm-hmm. it's not so, just something you learn to t- answer a test, which mm-hmm. we don't have <laughs> anymore mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. But hopefully it is something that you actually do learn. Because, you know, you talk about it in the discussion section, you talk about it with your classmates for mm-hmm. the team assignments, mm-hmm. and therefore, that's how we learn. Mm-hmm. We are, this is a big exercise in elaborate and All right. So how about the learning of behaviors, for example, or how do certain behaviors become automatic? For example, um, it started with classical conditioning back in... Uh, Pavlov's day where he trained dogs to salivate at the uh, sound of a bell, right? So how do we actually see classical conditioning in our daily lives? Does that still happen up to now? Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're talking about the how we learn. How Mm -hmm. do we actually learn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, how we learn uh, there are three kinds, there are three ways that we can learn. So you're talking about one also, classical conditioning. Classical conditioning. So that's one. Um, think about uh, when we, if we're going to discuss classical conditioning, we have to talk about how there's a um, neutral stimulus. There's the stimulus. Uh, I forget what the term is. Unconditioned, unconditioned stimulus. stimulus. Yes. The new, there's a neutral whatever stimulus. Mm-hmm. There's an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. Mm-hmm. So Pav, um, yeah, Pavlov said or discovered quite accidentally, as we are told, that um, there are just things that we don't need to teach people how to do. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's called an unconditioned no stimulus uh, listen that leads to an, an unconditioned response. Mm-hmm. So, and you can just think of these things as like natural functions, mm-hmm. natural functions of the body. If you want to tie them to your to the brain, these are related to um, the. <laughs> Your little dog is distracting me. Oh, <laughs> I can see him walking around. The <gasps> it's okay. Commercial. Okay. Um, <laughs> you don't have to edit that out. Also. Okay. It's yeah, fine. I forgot to take him out of my room uh, okay. before we started. So <laughs> I hope he doesn't. Yeah. Now we have a mascot. Yeah. That's hero, um, everyone. Anyway. All right. so, so unconditioned stimulus, uh, unconditioned response. Mm-hmm. When. When you, for example, see food, what happens to you? Uh, definitely salivate, but it's uh, my, uh, my mouth waters and sometimes your, your tummy grumbles. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So did you have to learn how to do that? No. no. It's a natural human function. Mm-hmm. Um, so those kinds of things are the ones that are related to our hypothalamus mm-hmm. okay our basic the basic human drives we don't talk about the hypothalamus in the mm-hmm. podcast mm-hmm. Last yes. but yes. Eh, it's there in your notes mm-hmm. so, so, so now you can, <laughs> it's in the uh, modules guys <laughs> okay. so um seeing food smelling food okay that information entering the sensory pathway to be processed by your brain uh, trigger certain um, physical reactions mm-hmm. like salivating. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's not learned, it's just the way your body works. That's mm-hmm. what unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned responses are. If you hear a loud noise, what's your likely reaction? 
are likely to get started like your body will jump all right that's an unconditioned stimulus the loud noise unconditioned responses that you jump okay. so classical conditioning tells us that uh, we learn behaviors actually by associating other stimulus to um, things that uh, naturally already produces a reaction, like food, like sound, and then the reactions that it naturally produces is, uh, in us, like salivating mm -hmm. and um, startling. Uh, you associate the food, for example, with something else. Mm -hmm. For example, before you, what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Um, maybe like a, a nice fudgy chocolate cake. All right. Mm -hmm. When you said that, was there an image in your mind? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a, it's like a glossy, dark brown chocolate. Fudge. Do you have a favorite brand? our bake shop mm. uh, there's one in our village that's really that's also a nice one okay. yeah all right mm -hmm. so you know exactly what it looks like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i had it for my birthday mm -hmm. oh okay mm -hmm. and wasn't that just lately so uh, actually it was in april oh okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> your, your birthday okay. was pretty recent though all right sorry yeah. i'm just i'm mm -hmm. just like being self-referential <laughs> <laughs> okay so um when you when you before you eat that cake or you smell that cake mm -hmm. likely you're you're gonna see it right because mm -hmm. you have eyes and you're you're uh typically able mm -hmm. so you see the cake mm -hmm. even just seeing the cake doesn't make you, your your mouth salivate mm -hmm. it's the smell the smell of chocolate. Oh, so if yeah. I showed you a picture of your oh. favorite cake, yeah. you're not oh. gonna say Oh yeah, it. yeah. It, it's it's a combination, but yeah, the the picture also. Yeah, oh, there's no smell. You can smell a picture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's like you can smell mm -hmm. a picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, one example of um, classical conditioning that you can really see in everyday life is advertising. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Suppose you're. Oh man. I can't use I can't really use the driving down the mm -hmm. road example anymore. But you suppose you're scrolling through uh, Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And then you see an image of sashimi. Mm -hmm. right? You seem to like sashimi. Yeah, I know I do. It's my favorite food. Mm -hmm. So I see it and I'm like, I, because every time I eat sashimi, I will see it first. And seeing is a neutral stimulus. It's just mm -hmm. this pink blob, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Like you're wearing salmon. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wearing salmon, salmon right salmon now. Kind of and now, right now, just because I'm talking about it and I noticed it, now my mouth is salivating <laughs> because that color is a neutral stimulus mm -hmm. that I now associate with salmon. Mm -hmm. And because every time I eat salmon, my mouth salivates a lot because mm -hmm. I need to digest it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So just those concepts, the, just those things occurring together in sequence a lot, and I like it. Okay? Neutral stimulus color, unconditioned stimulus food, unconditioned stimulus produces a unconditioned response, mm -hmm. hunger and salivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pair neutral stimulus and unconditional stimulus together enough times and obviously I like it so I, I've eaten a lot of salmon sashimi in my life mm -hmm. even without the unconditioned stimulus the neutral stimulus is enough to produce what is called a conditioned response so the neutral mm -hmm. stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus mm -hmm. producing a conditioned response mm -hmm. so now I look at the color of your shirt and it makes me salivate because it is a stimulus that triggers my classically conditioned response of salivation towards that mm -hmm. <laughs> Nice. That yeah. classical conditioning. So there are many things that we learn in this way. 
So yeah, that's kind of generally how advertising works. You see an image of a thing or on top. Mm-hmm the sound of a thing and it makes it triggers in you um the wanting of a thing but mm-hmm. that sound or that image is not the thing itself but that that is associated so closely with your experience of a thing that it becomes a substitute for the thing mm-hmm. itself it produces uh something else that normally it wouldn't mm-hmm. without without the close association Mm -hmm. how about learning things voluntarily like um uh making ourselves learn a habit or learn a learn how to play an instrument for example or even just get ourselves to um clean our room on a regular basis so how do we um and i believe the learning of voluntary responses is also another form of conditioning called operant conditioning so how does that play out also in our everyday lives all right so i'm glad you're asking this question because the thing with classical conditioning is it's not really something we do on purpose it's just something that happens um we can do it on purpose oh i missed my uh this is the part where i talk about uh, how i got classically conditioned to be to throw up smelling when I smell strawberry, um, strawberries, artificial strawberries, but we'll save that for another time. <laughs> ah, you weren't my student in Psych 101, so you never knew mm-hmm. that story. Mm-hmm. You, you never did. No, I haven't. Would you? Okay, now it's a mystery. Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, um. Okay, so classical conditioning likely not really controlled it's just something that we pick up because we are alive and we associate things that that, uh, um, occur close to each other Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, operant conditioning though is something a little different okay like you said the word operant means voluntary Mm -hmm. operant condition um how what is operant condition Operant conditioning involves uh, some more variables. Okay, so if classical conditioning is the UCS UCR turns into a CSCR condition stimulus condition response. Mm-hmm. Um, operant conditioning is about a um, the antecedent. Okay, something that occurs before behavior. Or an activating event, the behavior itself, okay, and then the consequence of the behavior, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and how uh, operant conditioning works, okay, is via the law of effect. Okay? Do you remember the law of effect? Yes. So if um, if a behavior is followed by a pleasurable consequence it's more likely to be repeated and if a behavior is followed by right. an unpleasant consequence mm-hmm. it's likely to be extinguished yeah mm-hmm. you're likely not to repeat it mm-hmm. and that sounds very logical and very straightforward mm-hmm. um so yeah uh who wants to do something that's unpleasant okay so the idea behind that is that if we uh change the consequence or do something about the consequence uh in this formula you we are more likely to have control over the behavior if we're going to repeat it or not okay Mm -hmm. so um it's easy to maybe it's good to remember our own lives okay like our own childhoods how how we grew up um whenever we did something that we're not supposed to do what what actually follows like for uh, example at home mm-hmm. you uh, what are the things that you did that you're not supposed to like you you made a the kitchen dirty or you made a mess somewhere in the house okay yeah yeah and then what happened what would happen so uh, someone would uh, like my mom i guess would get mad or there would be a form of scolding okay mm-hmm. scolding Mm-hmm. Okay, so the scolding in operant conditioning terms 
is what? Uh, punishment. Uh, okay, but in, okay. Uh, is it an activating event, a behavior, or a consequence? It's a consequence. Okay, it's a consequence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an unpleasant consequence. Mm -hmm. um, so punishment is not a very effective way of uh, doing operant conditioning. But we'll get to that in just a bit. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about operant conditioning mm -hmm. first. Okay. Um, but uh, so did you do those behaviors on purpose? Like, did you literally like mess up the kitchen like they do like oh no sprinkle no, no, no. flour I'm around just being a kid and okay. having a time of my life when things were simpler so at which at what point did you learn to not spill things um i think well after repeated incidents for sure so for the first few times uh i guess when i was still young it didn't have that it didn't sink in so much but then as you gain uh more and when you go to school and you realize that, oh th there are different people different kinds of people who are telling me oh this is not allowed mm -hmm. or if you get uh, scolded for it somewhere in school or in another place or in a public place so i guess that does reinforce that okay so you eventually learn to be careful with mm -hmm. or actually or maybe you grew up and just had the motor skills to be careful with it. <laughs> okay, whichever. But okay, you're pointing out a few um, important uh, concepts in operant conditional conditioning also. So they were repeated experiences of unpleasant consequences for a behavior, mm -hmm. okay, of, of spilling food, mm -hmm. okay, or like eating really messily mm -hmm. uh, and, and spilling food. And so that taught you the behavior of be more careful with food mm -hmm. okay um so this shows us something about one um punishment okay where do we start operant conditioning has a lot of components mm -hmm. let's break down it let's break it down into its components mm -hmm. so in your example uh, what is the activating event? So the, the behavior is spilling food, right? The behavior is spilling food. So the activating event, what um, precipitates the spilling the food? Yeah, what happens before? So it eating, I guess being hungry. Okay, um, all right. Being hungry mm -hmm. leads you to eat mm -hmm. in like mm -hmm. an excitable, fast way mm -hmm. and leads to the consequence of being scolded. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so activating event, behavior, consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and being scolded is a particular kind of consequence. And you just labeled what that was. What kind of consequence is that? A punishment. A punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so repeated experiences over a long period of time of punishment or being scolded for being a messy eater eventually taught you the behavior of being a neat eater mm -hmm. <laughs> i guess all right so this is one way that operant conditioning works um repeated unpleasant experiences teaches you to not be a messy eater mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like you said um it taught it it took you a long time mm -hmm. okay to uh learn that behavior and to repeated lessons okay so what might be according to the principles of operant conditioning and maybe you in this i'll share a little bit of my experiences not with myself but with my clients okay um it's the idea of instead of a punishment okay we talk about a, this, according to the law of effect the punishment is the unpleasant consequence, right? Mm -hmm. So unpleasant consequences makes you less likely to repeat the behavior. Pleasant consequences makes you likely to repeat the behavior. Mm -hmm. So in this context, what was the behavior that, for example, your your mom actually wanted you to exhibit? I guess um, stu studying and memorizing the, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, so memorizing the multiplication table, which okay. took a while for us to do. So when we would have 
every time we would get an answer right and she would make us repeat it, she would um, praise us and sometimes, yeah, give us a hug or a, a high five. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's not a, that's not a punishment. That's a reinforcement. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so how fast did you learn the multiplication table? It was pretty fast. Maybe I was, I think I was one of the first people to have it down. Ooh, flex, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it wasn't Something over a fast. matter of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe like a week, a week. All right. A so few you weeks. memorized mm -hmm. the, the multiplication table. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, because uh, you kept on being rewarded for it, reinforced for it, what that does is it makes you um, more likely to repeat the behavior of, well, I don't know if it's the behavior of being right, or it encouraged you to repeat the behavior of studying mm -hmm. and committing to memory, mm -hmm. the multiplication table. So the behavior is studying. Um, and so that taught you to study, okay? And I guess, that paid off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still college. Quite, yes, I'm still <laughs> quite a nerd, and it yeah, it was easier to study and motivate myself to study as I went through college. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's operant conditioning. Operant conditioning actually is altering the consequence so that you either stop doing a behavior or you start you continue doing a behavior. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the difference lies in the consequences. So it's either punishment, and um, okay, I guess the students can go look at positive punishment, the negative punishment, and um, uh, reinforcement. There's positive and negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So uh, like you were saying earlier, I think that was where you were trying to point me at, but mm -hmm. now I'll get to it. Research actually shows us that punishment is not as effective as reinforcement. Okay. And like you were saying, you, you were punished or scolded for being a messy eater, but you weren't actually reinforced mm -hmm. or, or praised mm -hmm. or, um, or taught a new behavior. Or taught a new behavior, which was to... I don't know, maybe clean just up after you myself. It, yeah. Or clean it after Lack yourself. Lack of motor right? skills also probably as a child. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. But because it was not reinforcement, uh, it took a long time. Okay. Um so I mean not just in your case, but actually in, in many people's cases, mm -hmm. it has been found that learning via reinforcement is actually more effective mm -hmm. rather than learning. Uh, learning uh, via punishment. Okay, why is that? Why do you think? Why is punishment not actually effective? Does it elicit it a fear kind of response? And I guess when we feel fear, we just want to run away, or right. it doesn't. Mm -hmm, it's not a very. Or we want to hide. We just want to hide it. Okay, mm -hmm. we want to. So the behavior that we learn is actually to avoid punishment. Mm -hmm. not to stop doing that behavior. Mm. Okay. So, um, and I don't know, again, I don't know if the people listening to this can relate, but um, when you are uh, grounded or punished for um, playing too many video games, does it make you not want to play video games? Uh, I don't think so. People still want to play. Yeah, you still video want to games. play, right? In fact, it might make you want to play video mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. What it teaches you is to hide the video games from the person mm -hmm. who punishes you. Yeah, so, so the associations that are formed aren't directly related to the behavior itself, but instead uh, are related to the punisher. Mm -hmm. So that's why it doesn't really, it's not the best way of altering behavior. Mm -hmm. Are changing behavior, therefore not the best way of, of learning. Mm -hmm. So knowing that reinforcement is more effective than using punishment, what kind of schedule works best for reinforcement? How do we know how often and when to reinforce behaviors so that it sticks? Okay. 
All right, so now we're going to talk about schedules of reinforcement. An exercise I used to give my psych, mm -hmm. my psych, my psych 101, mm -hmm. is um, one of their personal projects is to apply um, a an operant conditioning. Um, I guess it's an experiment of sorts. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Okay. On themselves. Yeah. So I ask, I would ask them to um, pick a behavior that you want to um, teach yourself, meaning to continue doing, and then um, so they would make a schedule of reinforcement for themselves. Uh, so the schedule of reinforcement refers to the how often you give yourself that positive consequence for doing an action, okay? So for example, if you want to, what's that thing? Work out, okay, mm -hmm. there. <laughs> if you wanna work out regularly, how are you gonna make that behavior stick? According to the principles of operant conditioning, if your workout, if that's the behavior, okay, and the behavior is followed by a positive consequence, you're likely to repeat that behavior. Mm -hmm. So what's a positive consequence for working out? I guess not only the, the high, but maybe saying that you're allowed to have just a little nice snack, like a healthy snack after. It's something I would do. Like, a, okay. yeah. <laughs> Giving yourself a healthy snack after every workout which could be actually, yeah, that's actually quite healthy practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you should eat um, mm -hmm. of something. Course. Yeah, Feel, um, refueling is important after after a workout, um, or you know, drink something. I mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, doing giving yourself that positive consequence after every performance of action that's called a um, continuous, that's called continuous reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the schedule, that's, what is that? Ratio? Yeah. Yeah. It's ratio, right? Like a fixed ratio. Yeah. Because okay. it's, it's a, it's a set number of times per uh, number of behaviors yeah. that you perform. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a fixed ratio. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so, all right, that's one kind of schedule that you could follow. You can follow a fixed ratio, or you can even count, okay, after every three workouts, I can eat a heavy carb meal, mm -hmm. okay? So, um, and that would be still a fixed, uh, no, that's an interval. Mm -hmm. Fixed interval. Yeah. Because after, uh, after three or after an interval of a certain fixed period of time, that's yeah. when you um, reinforce again and that repeats. So like every three workouts, okay. I'll, I'll have a high carb meal. All right, so, um, so that's the fixed schedule. So mm -hmm. a fixed schedule could be fixed ratio or fixed uh, interval. Mm -hmm. So a fixed ratio is more continuous, meaning it's more regular. Mm -hmm. And the fixed interval is still continuous and regular, but there are intervals. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit more spaced out. Mm -hmm. Or, okay, so that's one way. And that's actually the recommended way of giving yourself reinforcement if you're just starting out. Because if you're starting out a behavior, you want to give yourself that pleasant consequence pretty regularly mm -hmm. because you, you want to feel good about what you're doing. Okay. But Thing is, okay, for example, if your schedule of reinforcement is regular all the time, what's going to happen the moment you stop giving yourself that reinforcement? Most likely you'll be not motivated anymore to do it if the, right. if the reinforcement is gone and you're so used to having it. All right, so um, just take away the reinforcement, the behavior goes away. But that's not what learning is. We want the behavior to stick. And that's what this other kind of uh, um, schedule is for, which is 
a variable the variable schedule either right. variable ratio or vari variable interval mm -hmm. all right so a variable ratio for example would be you're not sure you're not sure when you're gonna get it okay mm -hmm. it means for um so going with the workout uh and the food you eat after example you could say after every between one to three workouts either in after the first one after the second one or after the third one i will give myself a snack i don't know if it will be after the first one or after the second one or after the third one but somewhere there in the, in, in between those three options i will get a snack yeah so and then the variable interval will be between between the third to the seventh day mm -hmm. somewhere in there i will have a high carb meal. yeah i don't know if it's gonna happen early or later mm -hmm. or at all but i may give myself uh that reinforcement okay so the all that needs to be remembered really is that it becomes very irregular Okay, the reinforcement does not come after every performance of the task. And why is that um, why is that important, do you think? Um, I guess because reinforcement isn't always a an option or it might not always be available. So we have to get used to performing the behavior without always being um, reinforced. reinforced for it. And that hopefully helps it stick better. So right. able is effective for that. Right, right. So um, going towards uh, interval variable, uh, variable interval is more intermittent, okay, and less continuous than fixed ratio. Mm -hmm. Fixed ratio is after each set. Um, uh, so, so when you're just starting out the behavior, it's better if it's more continuous, more fixed. And but later on, if you want to stick to that behavior, it's better to move your schedule into a more intermittent kind, so more variable, more interval. Um, and yeah, so that's how you teach yourself via operant conditioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, maybe um, the students can kind of get ideas about how to apply this in their own life mm -hmm. like so rewarding yourself or reinforcing yourself after each thing uh each good good behavior is good at first but it might not be effective in the long term so spacing out your rewards and making it less continuous more intermittent after a while uh well um research shows that um, behaviors that are more intermittently reinforced are less likely to be extinguished. Mm -hmm. And when we, the term extinguished means just a learned behavior, you stop doing it. <laughs> okay, the behavior becomes extinguished. So behaviors are more likely to, to be permanent if the reinforcement of it is intermittent. Mm -hmm. All right. So in terms of how we learn, we've talked about classical conditioning and we see that in advertising and operant conditioning seen in how we can motivate ourselves or shape our actions in incremental ways to, uh, by reinforcement or sometimes by the addition of punishment um, to modify our behaviors. So, mm -hmm. but how about, can we learn without reinforcement? Is there a way we can just see things and then actually learn without copying it right at the onset? Okay, um, so there's another kind of learning, not just um, conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, observational learning. Mm -hmm. okay? And this is actually also a very common kind of learning. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were a kid, were there some things that you would see, like behaviors that you would see? I don't know something as simple as watching somebody cook mm -hmm. eggs. oh i love <laughs> i love and, yes okay yeah. so or like i don't know like in the kitchen would you see people cook sometimes mm -hmm. yeah watching right. my 
my relatives cook sometimes. Okay, so there. Uh, my question is: Do you now cook sometimes? I know how to cook. Okay. I know how to cook. That is the yeah. important thing. If I had to survive yeah. by myself, I, yeah. I keep myself alive. Yeah. And that was my question. After all, do you, <laughs> can you cook? Mm -hmm. Period. I'm not mm -hmm. asking if it's good or not, <laughs> but can you? All right. So, um, have you ever? Uh, did you ever take like cooking lessons? Uh, I think I took a baking class once or twice. Okay. Yes. All right. But no, you never actually. Oh, here is how you make scrambled eggs. Take mm -hmm. that. Uh, actually, someone taught me my. Um, my mom taught me that before, so okay. Mm -hmm. So I I remember the steps, and she would show me how to do it herself, and then I would copy it after watching her. All right. Okay. So that's already um, behavioral uh, observational learning, mm -hmm. right? Observational learning is just you have a model, like somebody you 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 look up to, or you know is uh, this person can cook. And you watch that person. And sometimes, and maybe even before you were actually taught the steps, you were already you already knew mm -hmm. um, just by watching. Just by watching her, yeah. Just by watching her. Makes just by watching her. her. Right. Yeah. So this is this is uh, observational learning. And observational learning is actually quite simple. And maybe the moment I describe it, every people are going to be like, oh, oh okay, yeah, I do that. Um, it involves four, um, four steps, four uh, important um, ingredients for observational learning. And the first ingredient is really attention. Mm -hmm. If you're going to learn something, you have to pay attention to it. So, for example, you as a little kid, watching your mom cook eggs okay you're paying attention to that and not something else okay so that's step one okay mm -hmm. attention and then step two is what's the term um but step two is your actual remembering it mm -hmm. okay memory mm -hmm. okay so you form a memory based on what you observe and attend it to so you reproduce that action but inside your head mm -hmm. so you you're almost rehearsing it mentally yeah yeah it's also a rehearsal right okay. so you were you probably uh, i'll describe it myself so um i know that to make scrambled eggs you need a bowl mm -hmm. and then you need to crack the eggs open in the bowl and the way I first learned how to make scrambled eggs was that you have to beat the eggs, okay, which is li literally actually just mixing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, the term "beat" actually doesn't even exist; it's just like you know, it's like mixing the eggs. Um, and then you put the pan on top of the stove, turn on the stove, put oil in the pan. Put the beat, the beat and eggs, and then uh, you put salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was a kid, just put salt while beating the eggs. Mm -hmm. That's actually not how I do it anymore. Okay, <laughs> but you put salt, you put it, all of that, you dump it into the pan, and then what do you do? You kind of mix it okay, as it's cooking, and that's scrambled eggs. And I knew all of that just by watching how it used to be done. And I remembered it. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, the next step is um, is it is the formatter imitation? I think it's imitation afterwards. So after you mentally rehearse it, you have yeah. to actually perform the behavior. Right. And the first time, at first, what you're gonna do is you're gonna imitate the behavior first. Mm -hmm. So. So that's what I did, okay? And for a long time, it was that imitation of the observed behavior. Bowl, crack open, crack open the eggs, beat it, put salt, oil in the pan, make it hot, put the egg, beaten eggs, and then mix, yeah. But learning doesn't actually end there, okay? Mm -hmm. Learning is, um, because 
why would I repeat that behavior for no reason? Okay? Mm -hmm. Another key ingredient in, is in learning is motivation. Mm -hmm. okay? So your reason for wanting to repeat that behavior is key in learning that behavior. So growing up, I think I cooked eggs just because I was curious and I wanted to feel like a grown up and so I would cook eggs. Um, later on, I would cook eggs because I was hungry. <laughs> and so I would cook eggs. But even later on, like when I was, uh, maybe I was in college already. Okay? I had a different motivation to cook eggs. It was because I wanted to eat something nice. Okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here is where um, the learning truly happens. It becomes a truly learned behavior when you add or subtract from the thing you just imitated. So it's not imitated exactly anymore. You have made that behavior your own. Mm -hmm. So I now have my own way of cooking eggs and it's not exactly the same as that imitated behavior that I saw when I was a child. Now I put the, I don't even use a frying pan. I use a saucepan. And what I do is, I, while the pan off of the heat, I crack the eggs and put them in the pan. And then I put a large chunk of butter in the pan. And then I put the pan on the heat and I don't even beat the eggs. While the pan is on the heat, I will start beating the eggs while it is on the heat. Okay. And, and then I'll just found that it tastes better for you. Yeah. I like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, when it is more formed, that's when I put the salt and then I put mm -hmm. some sour cream. And Ooh. that's how I like my scrambled eggs now. And then I put a lot of pepper on top after. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's now my learned behavior. Okay. At first, I observed it from other people. And then I observed it from, from a different model to, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's probably some cooking show. I observed it again. And then I applied it to my own. Uh, practice i put i took out some steps and i added some more steps and i mixed it up but then because my motivation was to eat eggs the way i wanted <laughs> it motivated me to make that behavior my own mm -hmm. okay so so that is what observation learning is actually mm -hmm. learning occurs when you're it is not just a direct imitation mm -hmm. you have subtracted or added from it and therefore, that behavior becomes your own, okay? Instead of just a mimic of something you saw a model perform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our students right now, or anyone who's watching this and working during quarantine, I guess it's, um, it's different because there's a lack of um, reinforcement from teachers or a lot of structured... Uh, requirements or structured tests that are delivered physically, for example. So how can we, what are the ways where we can encourage students right now to, how can we facilitate their, their online learning or this kind of learning without a lot of conditioning? Can they make conditioning for themselves or how can they motivate themselves to um, be more excited about learning? Well, um, we have now talked about two big things that are really important. I think when it comes to motivating yourself or or um, changing your practices so that you learn more or you're able to retain information more. Uh, one is operant conditioning. So uh, you can kind of do something about uh, reinforcement. So when you study, how do you reinforce yourself for studying? So you can play around with the schedules of reinforcement there. Um, I want also to really stress the fact that reinforcement doesn't necessarily have to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. A pleasant consequence is not, doesn't need to be something bought. It doesn't need to be something big, even something like, I don't know, what's like a really small pleasant consequence that I like? Or being able to watch something, I think, yeah. like a like a fun video after. Okay, I'll just finish this chunk of work and then I'll reward myself by 
watching my favorite show or what, okay. whatever's new on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah 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 so so that's something or um food <laughs> you know or, I, that's how i used to reward myself when i was in college mm -hmm. food um so if i did this i would be able i would order food that i wouldn't just normally order and that would be my reward for it myself so um using reinforcement to kind of encourage you uh to do your work uh, that's that's something that um maybe they can play around with mm -hmm. another one really also and i think for me this is more important it's elaborate the rehearsal okay? mm -hmm. so um taking these concepts and really asking how is this true in my life and um maybe finding someone to talk to about it so that it's because you know the more you explain it to somebody else and that somebody else explain explains their own experiences to you one it's more fun which is um a reinforcement in itself of making a thing fun is a positive reinforcement so that's one and then it also becomes elaborate rehearsal because it's not just your experience it's your friend's experience and then it becomes very relevant to your life that's something that can make learning um what uh not just fun but permanent mm -hmm. um the things that you will learn will really be embedded in your memory and so and that's what learning is anyway right mm -hmm. learning is you know the point of it is that it's useful for you so elaborate rehearsal is one big way and it's really the the strategy i encourage the most okay for the psych people even though um the for people who are thinking about taking um the like the licensure for example for um psychometrician okay that test. um i don't know when that's gonna happen probably sometime next year at the year yeah sometime next year but um when you are one thing to remember is this concept called encoding specificity okay mm -hmm where the state in which you encode okay what that means when we say encode that's when the information enters okay? the state in which you encode is if that state in which you encode is the same state in which you retrieve and retrieve is remembering mm -hmm. like pulling something out from your memory uh you are more retrieval is better if the encoding situation and the retrieval situation are very similar okay so right now um, if you're studying something that you want to remember later on like for example you can take a licensure exam remember uh where you encoded it okay so if you study in your room are you studying in your bed or are you studying in your desk okay and if later on you're going to review it again for you know or you want to remember it again are you going to remember that on a bed or on a desk okay mm -hmm. and usually tests are taken on yeah. a bed yeah. and not a desk yeah. right so um just making these healthy habits healthy habits of um where you actually encode this information can help you um and making that encoding a little more structured like making sure it's on the bed it's on the desk not the bed or not i don't know not in the bathroom mm -hmm. or whatever uh, um can actually help you remember it better when you actually need to okay so that's why i i, I really say don't study on the bed because you're never gonna try to, you're never gonna need to remember that information while you're on the bed you're always gonna need to remember that situation in a very different setting so studying in the setting closest to that situation where you're going to remember it that's called the idea is called encoding specificity mm -hmm. so that's another tip maybe that uh, could come in handy to the people studying right now all right so i hope everyone listening gets to apply and internalize all the learning and memory concepts um that they've heard about through their own study routines and um, their ways of 
wanting to change their other behaviors or learn new skills or just facilitate online learning in general. So I guess that also rounds out our discussion on why learning is important, how we learn, and how to apply it nowadays in, in our daily lives. So yeah. that's a, another podcast wrapped up. So thank you, ma'am. Okay. Next, if anyone right. has questions, feel free yes. to send them in. Yeah, and then we'll, and then we'll answer those questions. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ina. Thank you, ma'am.